Hey, welcome to Theo Live, episode 29. Still a little bit under the weather. Uh, got got my tea. I'm hoping that my voice is able to like make it through. I've had a hard time when I've been talking for extended periods of time ever since the Rona, and so like I'm feeling good. I'm getting tired. You know, like I'm I'm still complaining about this thing. I've had like I've been done with it for like a week and a half, but I, you know. It's what I do. I complain a little bit. That's what I do on my channel. Sometimes it's really edifying and I want to build you up and I'm hoping today I'm able to build you up a little bit. But sometimes I just got to complain a little bit and uh, whine like a little baby about how my throat still hurts. I didn't have it nearly as bad as tons of other people. But my throat still hurts a little bit. So uh, I'm hoping that I'll be able to make it through with you guys today because I want to talk about biblical counseling. Uh, it's one of those topics that there's a lot of different feelings about. And I actually have a lot of different feelings about it. Because even as you hear that term biblical counseling, like who's going to argue with that, right? All, all of us who are Christians should think about that idea of biblical counseling. And that just, it just sounds right, you know? Like it's, it's just good stuff. At least that's what it would sound like. But, uh, as most things, you know, you gotta, you gotta look behind the name. You gotta do a little bit of research and figure out what does someone actually mean when they're talking about biblical counseling. I want to know what you guys think today. So make sure if you're watching this right now, if you're live, I can see that there are 17 people who are watching this. That's what my little thing tells me. Um, and so if you're here and you're watching this, hop into the chat as we move along. And I want to know what you think about these things, because on my channel, I know sometimes, you know, I, I'm the one who turns on the camera, gets the lights going and, uh, I'm the one talking to the microphone. So sometimes it could be a bit of a lecture. And today I really don't want it to be that. I want to be able to have like some questions, some answers, go back and forth between you guys and, you know, figure out what you guys think about this idea of biblical counseling, maybe even some of your experiences. Now, I want you to be careful about that. Uh, and even myself, I need to be careful about what I share in this, because when we're talking about counseling scenarios, there's a lot of confidentiality that needs to be maintained in that. And this is a public format, so I don't want us to go too deep into our own stories unless you feel comfortable in sharing that publicly. Um, but I, I think all of us who are Christians who've been involved in the church for an extended amount of time have some different stories <laughs> about this idea of biblical counseling, whether the church should actually do it, what kind of counseling should the church be involved with, all that kind of stuff. We're going to be talking about it today. Uh, but as you guys are coming in, make sure uh, a lot of you guys have already done that, but hit the like button. Uh, if you're new to the channel, which there are a lot of people who are just checking out my content lately, uh, ever since I've really been covering this specific story with John MacArthur. Um, if you're just checking out the channel, hey, think about subscribing. Uh, I talk a lot about this kind of stuff. Every Monday I do this show where I do um, a live theology show where I try to interact with you. And things have changed a little bit lately uh, because I was going on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday format for a bit where, you know, Monday, Theo Live, Wednesday or Thursday, I was putting out just a normal video. Sometimes that was about theology. Sometimes that was about church culture. Uh, but then on Friday, I was dropping my best book series, which I love books. You can see it in the background. I love to read theology, very passionate about reading uh, and passionate about books in general. Uh, but uh, that video is now uh, living in a different home. Uh, if you've been watching the channel last week or so, I've been talking about this newsletter and I would love it if you're watching this to sign up for that newsletter. All it is, is a monthly email where I go over just a few little changes, updates to the channel, uh, talk a little bit about some websites that I found helpful, some articles and videos from other content creators here on YouTube that I want you to check out. And then at the bottom of my newsletter every month, I'm going to be putting a new video, an exclusive video in that best book series. 
uh, and it's only going to live on the newsletter. So if you like that series and you haven't heard about the newsletter yet, there's a link in the description of this video. You can sign up for that newsletter. And really what that's about is not just like getting your email and being like, hey, I got it. I'm going to send you all the all the spams. Uh, not going to do that. But uh, what that's about is building the base of this channel. I would love for this show specifically uh, to be able to have uh, some guests on, you know, and some of these bigger guests to be able to come in and talk about, you know, what is biblical counseling? Let's get an expert opinion, stuff like that. Or if we're talking about something, uh, you know, like Calvinism, I would love to have like a well-known Calvinist come on and we can explain, or if we're trying to do a debate, you know, some, someone who would uh, classify themselves as an Arminianist, uh, come on in and we can, we can have that talk and you know, like that kind of stuff. But in order to do that, I need to grow the base a little bit. And that's what the newsletter is all about. Uh, so if you haven't signed up for that, definitely give it a shot. Uh, got a lot of few, uh, people hopping into the chat, so definitely want to say hi before we get things going. Uh, Sean hopping in and saying, I used to have those Playmobil characters as a kid. Oh, yeah, you're talking, I got a little little Martin Luther back there, and you probably saw him on the, the countdown. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot of them. I had friends who had a lot of them. I was a Lego guy, still a Lego guy. Got a lot of Lego just right over there. Uh, it's it's building, it's construction stuff. Okay. It's manly. All right. Don't get on me about toys. It's, it's manly stuff. Uh, but yeah, I wasn't really a Playmobil guy, but when I saw little Luther, I was like, I got to get that. Uh, Misty hopping in and saying, Hey, uh, I appreciated your last video on this subject and started following. Uh, I think it lacks, uh, it lacks the understanding of God's common grace. Oh yes. We'll be talking about that. I don't think she's talking about my last video. I think she's talking about biblical counseling, <laughs> but yeah, thanks for hopping in here, Missy. Uh, Tim, isn't a pastor in charge of biblical counseling? It's not the same as the psych counseling program classes I took. Yes, we will talk about it for sure. Uh, Chester, uh, hello, brother Dean. Have a blessed, glorious resurrection week. What is the best Bible study are you recommending? Uh, that is... Uh, a really good question that I will answer at some point on my channel, Chester, or maybe uh, hit me up on Twitter. I know you're over there and uh, I could answer that. Uh, Jeff hopping in here. I think there's helpful ways in which biblical counseling can be done if it is geared towards helping a Christian see God in the midst of their sin slash suffering. And there's another one here. I have, however, had a difficult experience in my own counseling and a struggle against sin where my counselor shared a text which forbid the sin I was doing, failed to deal with my heart. Yeah, um, we, we will definitely talk about it because as we get going, you're going to find out that I definitely think that there are good things about biblical counseling and there are some negative things and I want to be able to deal with that even handedly. Um, uh, let's see. I think I saw a few other people, uh, observation Lee, uh, observantly. I think I found you through Ruslan. Appreciate that. Yeah. Ruslan shared a couple videos. It's pretty exciting. Um, and Sarah catching live for the first time. Hey, welcome to the live show. That's awesome. Excited about this conversation. Your videos have been a huge blessing. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, John Hayes. What is he going to say? And now Dean has branched into the spam folders. It sounds like uh, I messed I messed my own joke up. I'll sign up if you have signed up, if you haven't signed from Theo. Um, hey, you know what? Just for you, man. I'll send you a specific email about. It. All right, I'll hop back into the the chat here in a little bit. But let's let's start talking about this idea of biblical counseling because, like I said. As I say that, it sounds like a really good thing, and it sounds like a very general thing. Like you're just talking about pastors and spiritual leaders within the church. Um, they, they should do counseling, right? So, of course, biblical counseling would be something that would be looked at very positively. Uh, now, the reason why this is coming up, and you saw the thumbnail, you saw John MacArthur, and you saw jo uh, Dr. John Street, who is the chair of biblical counseling at the Master's University and Seminary, um, 
why I want to talk about this is because some of the things that Julie Royce shared in her article, some of the uh, video clips that have gone around and I reacted to here on this channel, uh, it's being defended. A lot of that is being defended, those, those specific clips and saying, uh, well, you, you don't get the context. You have to watch the bigger video uh, and, and then you'll find the context of these little clips. Uh, the problem with that is that a lot of the, like the defense of those clips is coming from people who are arguing for context, but unfortunately, and I'm not trying to call anyone out, this isn't a drama channel, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of those people who are saying you need the context don't understand the context of biblical counseling, and specifically the idea of newthetic counseling, where it comes from, and what Dr. John Street has taught at Masters and John MacArthur as well. Uh, they aren't taking into uh, consideration with those clips the context of the whole philosophy of biblical counseling. Because as someone, like to peel the curtain back a little bit, you know, I have, I have a bachelor's in, in Bible, I have a master's of arts in uh, ministry, and I have a master's of divinity from a very conservative Baptist school. That, that's my background. And, and so I actually was taught a lot of this type of philosophy of counseling. And, um, you know, a lot of this, we'll talk about it here in a minute, comes from Jay Adams. And uh, Jay Adams is very problematic for me. Uh, I had to read a lot of his books. I had to do uh, a lot of book reviews at a high level. I understand where, where that philosophy is coming from. I understand the implications of some of the aspects of that philosophy. And I would argue, and what we're going to look at today is that these statements that Dr. John Street made in those uh, several clips that have gone around, and if, if you haven't watched it, I have another video here on my channel uh, where I reacted to one of them. There's um, one of my friends on Twitter, Christine Pack. Uh, she, she's talked a lot about it on her Twitter, uh, so you can go and look up Christine Pack and uh, see a lot of that kind of stuff as well. Um, but there are a lot of people who've been reacting to that. And this is some of the defense that's been coming out and saying, hey, context matters. Well, here I am to say, yeah, I agree. Context matters. So let's look at the broader context of where these ki uh, kinds of statements are coming from. So let's look here at uh, this is uh, just from the Masters University, um, because a lot of people, they, they, they just didn't maybe like they come from different backgrounds. I get it. Like I'm, I'm from a fundamentalist background. That's, that's where I came from. And so I understand some of these more fundamentalist uh, teachings and systems and programs. And when I hear certain words, I know to look behind certain things and not everyone comes from that background. So I'm not trying to throw shade on anybody, but it's clearly laid out here. Uh, this is John Street's bio. Uh, it says he is also a fellow and the president of the Board of Trustees of the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, ACBC. Now, that is a new name uh, that they came up with. Before, it was something like the Newthetic Something Something uh, Association. Uh, but the ACBC, now this is a certification program and association where they're basically trying to say, hey, we have this view of newthetic counseling. Now, there would be, let, let's zoom out for a sec and talk about two extremes uh, when it comes to Christians and counseling. Um, and I, I don't know, I shouldn't say extremes, but let's just talk about two of these points. There is newthetic counseling is what we're going to talk about today, otherwise known as biblical counseling. Uh, this would be using the Bible. Just using the Bible alone as uh, basically a textbook on how to deal with the human condition. And so you have newthetic counseling over here. And then over here on the other side, the flip of the coin, if you will, uh, you have psychology, modern psychology. And so uh, that this would involve like the teachings uh, of, um, you know, Freud would be like the, probably the most well-known, uh, all those kinds of, uh, you know, just normal counselors, normal as in like what you would, 
typically describe as far as uh, psychological counseling, psychiatrists, all of that would fit into this category of modern psychology. So you have these two points. And so what happened in developing this thing of ACBC and where it came from uh, really is about um, this one guy, really. Uh, this is from ACBC's website. The Association of Certified Biblical Counselors was founded in 1976. It's not that old, okay? Uh, in the previous decade, Jay Adams had created the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation, CCEF, as a center for the training of biblical counselors. As his model of biblical counseling developed, it became clear that the biblical counseling movement needed more than training. It needed certification. Uh, a little bit lower here. Recognizing this crucial need, Jay Adams and the board of CCEF created an independent certifying organization to do this work. Originally named the National Association of Nuthetic Counselors, our association began using a three-part process of evaluating, including training in the fundamentals of biblical counseling, testing and counseling and theology, and supervision to demonstrate counseling skills. So where does ACBC come from that's really what i want us to think about here uh as we get things rolling uh this might be a long stream i'm really hoping it's not because i got kids upstairs on ipads uh it's spring break so they're they're having fun uh but you know can't leave them alone with disney plus for all that long <coughs> all right so uh where does it come from well it comes from this guy J. Adams. Now, J. Adams is an interesting figure. He's a very polarizing figure. As I said at the beginning, uh, polarizing for me. Like I said, I had to read a lot of his books. Now, J. Adams was a Presbyterian minister, and eventually he went on to, uh, to teach at Westminster. And uh, when he was going there, he was asked to develop uh, a course on the theology of pastoral ministry. And so at the core of that, Jay Adams thought, you know, I need to develop some kind of system for counseling because he viewed counseling as one of the main aspects of what the pastor does in the life of the congregation, uh, that he is to counsel them. Uh, I would argue that that isn't necessarily true. Uh, I would argue that discipleship is really what... Um, what we see in the New Testament and also throughout church history. But he thought it was counseling. And so he was trying to implement, you know, uh, what textbook could I, could I use for, for this class? What do I need to prepare for? You know, some resources. I need resources to teach this graduate level class. I will also just note, and I don't mean to just bash Jay Adams with this, uh, but it is important to understand that Jay Adams had no education on counseling, not, not anything that was on like a grand scale as far as like he didn't have a master's in counseling. Uh, he had no, no uh, uh, degree in psychology, none of that. Now, a lot of people, when they hear that, will just say, oh, okay, well, you're just looking at secular um, credentials. Uh, but he had a bachelor's in theology, he had a master's in theology, not an MDiv. Uh, he had an MTS. And then uh, he had a PhD from the University of Missouri in speech. So why do I bring that up? I just want us to make sure that we understand we're talking about a man. Now, a lot of people in the circles that I ran in and grew up in and got a lot of my education in, uh, they view Jay Adams as like the guy, like he wrote a, like almost like a hundred books or something like that. And they would have all of them on his shelves. And I had a lot of them in, on my shelves because I had to take a lot of these courses. Uh, so in 1970, I think it was, he, he wrote his most famous book, which is competent to counsel. So when he was going through like this, this class that he was preparing, he was thinking, all right, I need to have, uh, you know, these resources to be able to give to my students. Couldn't find any that he thought was appropriate. He saw a lot of like secular psychology impacting the church. And so he basically came up with his own and that was competent to counsel. And from there, he actually wrote a lot more and became very, very influential, especially amongst 
more conservative Christian circles. Now, he developed a lot of different um, strategies on how to deal with sin. Uh, and that was really like his whole thing was uh, looking at the human condition and seeing it through the lens of theology and saying, hey, we're all sinners. So your problem is sin. Uh, you have a sin problem. And what can we have that can remedy that sin problem? Well, the only tool that we have is the Word of God. So he, he wanted to use the Word of God to be able to uh, go at some of these sinful problems that people would come to him with. And the problem that developed, um, maybe partially because of his education, maybe partially the background, is that he was looking at everything uh, through a spiritual lens. And the problem with that, and actually a lot of these... Like, I don't, I don't mean to put everyone in the same camp as Jay Adams. I don't want to do that because there's a big difference between a lot of these biblical counselors, between a lot of newthetic counselors. There are some great ones. All right. Uh, this is not everyone, but there are a lot of people who would just look at people with their problems and spiritualize everything and try to say that whatever issue you come in with, has something to do with your sin. And that's why a lot of these people will say, um, you have to be a Christian in order for me to do counseling with you. And uh, I think that's actually pretty appropriate when it comes to the life of the church. And if we're talking about a pastor, um, because you're not going to get very far without having, you know, th having to have them understand the gospel. Like you're not going to be able to get a lot of progress. So it makes sense in a certain way. Um, but when we're talking about outside the church, then it becomes like a bigger problem. But a lot of them will say any, anything but the gospel is pre-counseling. Like, so if anyone comes in with an issue, well, they're going to, they're going to say that most likely it's a sin problem. And um, in order to remedy that sin problem, you need to believe the gospel. And if so, if you don't believe the gospel, there's not going to be any solution. There isn't going to be any resolution. And that's actually something that a lot of ACBC guys teach. They teach that, um, you know, there isn't any kind of solution that the world can offer you uh, because you have a sin problem. And the only person who can solve that sin problem is Jesus Christ. So you need the Bible. You need biblical counseling. You need to look at the gospel. Now, of course, any Christian would say, Yes, you need Jesus. <laughs> like you need you need Jesus, of course. We want to give you Jesus, um, but uh, I think that there's a big difference between uh, this idea of biblical counselors, newthetic counselors, and Christian counselors who would say that there there are some good things out there in the world as far as uh, different strategies, different understandings when it comes to especially when it comes to physical things, because we are physical people. And while ACBC guys would probably say, of course, of course, we're physical people. We, we are, um, you know, we are spirit and we are body. So we need to remedy the whole thing. And so some of them would say that, of course, medicine would be a part of that. But a lot of ACBC guys, uh, counselors would say, no, actually, you shouldn't be using medicine. We'll, we'll get into that here in a minute. I don't want to get too far without, you know, interacting with you guys. Like I said, I want this to be a conversation. Uh, so let's see, uh, Sarah hopping in here again. Uh, the ACBC counselor my husband and I saw was very wise and was an advocate for safety and obeying the law of the land. My church dealt with us similarly to the way GCC church scandal uh, ended up having to leave uh, my church over it after appealing to my pastor with scripture and humility Regular Baptist Church, still healing from the trauma. Well, that's my background too. Uh, uh, General Association of Regular Baptists. Um, yeah, uh, there there are some good things that are usually said in these kinds of scenarios. Um, they go to the Word of God and they do show they're like, hey, you know, if this is sin, they show where it's sin. Those are good things. But there is this common thread of questioning. Uh, people like they say they always say data retrieval um, but it's it's different they they aren't necessarily listening they are acquiring data so there are specific questions now those specific questions that get asked a lot um, 
they can make the the person who's coming to counseling feel uh, very much like the villain. Um, and you know, what kind of sin have you done? You know, uh, a lot of things that get asked and what I was trained on asking when it came to some of these issues, especially when it came to things that were like on that verge of the line between going from, all right, you can be helped by biblical counseling, or you need to see a medical professional on that line. I was always told, you know, ask them if they drink. Uh, ask them if they do drugs, what kind of drugs have they done? Have them write out a list of these things. Or when it came to sexual sins, uh, you know, how many partners have they had? You know, what was the time frame of those things? That's what I was taught on how to deal with some of these things and what a lot of these guys actually end up doing. <coughs> Let's see, Misty. Yes, biblical counseling lacks the understanding of God's common grace. This, yeah, this is an important theme. You interpreted my comment correctly. Sorry for not being clear. No, you definitely were clear. Uh, Lantini, is that Italian? Yes, it is. Uh, let's see. Uh, in general, I think pastors need to be educated in abuse and mental health. Not everything is a sin to repent of, such as neurodiversity. Boy, do I know that. Uh, we'll talk about that here in a minute, Sarah. Um, okay. You're interacting there. Where does the where does FBI and crime expertise come in? What? I'm not I'm not exactly sure what you mean, Kale. I don't know if that's just you being funny. <coughs> uh, let's see. Uh, those who have been trained in this kind of counseling do not understand trauma and how it physically affects your brain and body. See, see, that's the important thing when we're coming into this conversation. We need to talk not just about spiritual. We need to talk about physical. And this is where uh, the idea of biblical counseling, I believe, kind of falls apart or at least fails in reaching like a good conclusion for that counselee is that you're not dealing with the physical problem when you're always trying to make everything into a spiritual issue. You know, in Bible college, I was always told, you know, everything is a heart issue, Dean. Everything is a heart issue. That's not accurate. There are some things that we have that are within our body that we are not able to ascertain why certain uh, impulses happen. Uh, we cannot ascertain where that desire... Um, like James talks about, uh, James talks about how everyone is led astray by their own desire, their lust. That's how we end up sinning. Well, that's easy to tell sometimes, you know, like if you lust, you can like see pretty clearly where that desire is coming from and you can attack that thing. Well, that's, those are the kind of issues that biblical counseling are great at being able to help counselees with. But what about like what was just said, neurodiversity? Um, you know, again, like I always come back, my son is on the autism spectrum. A lot of biblical counselors, while they would say that autism is a real thing, they would say that the majority of different things that my son would end up doing or those who would be on the autism spectrum would end up doing because of that autism would be sin. I've heard that. Like it's, it's a real thing. Uh, Luke, Luke hopping in. I need to watch your sermon that you uploaded, bud. Uh, pastors, and I can speak for them because I am one, need to do a better job in counseling settings to refer them to true licensed counselors. Absolutely. Uh, Genuine JC, the danger in, uh, in speaking in absolutes, our sin nature is absolutely always part of the problem, but it is dangerous to only encourage confession and repentance. Interesting, yes. Uh, the pastor's job is to give biblical spiritual guidance and insight. If there is a case in counseling where a pastor cannot do that, they need to be okay with allowing their client to go elsewhere. Unfortunately, a lot of those people would say that if you fail in this biblical counseling scenario, uh, like, yeah, I've even heard that there are contracts, okay? Like, this is not conspiracy theory stuff. I'm talking practically. I've talked with people who have contracts when they enter into counseling scenarios. If you end up leaving this counseling scenario and there hasn't been, like, let's talk about, like, a marriage and, um, you know, like, there 
they're separated or something like that. Well, then they'll go to church discipline. And I think that's pretty clearly what happened there with Grace Community Church. I'm not saying that there was a contract, but I've heard like, if, if you don't follow through with my teaching, then you will be moved into the steps leading up to church discipline and follow that in Matthew 18. If you give up on my counseling, there is, there's a little bit of pride to some of these things. Um, Sarah, there is a definite lack of acknowledgement of a power dynamic issue, particularly when it comes to husbands abusing wives. Also common belief that women are easily deceived or trying to take over. Uh, we will talk about that part. <laughs> uh, have you been reading Jay Adams? Um, Tim, uh, is this where the term for generational curse comes in? As in when someone is going through past trauma and develops unhealthy coping mechanisms like drinking or doing drugs. I think that, that can be part of it, Tim, for sure. Um, like here, I, I do want to make sure, like I'm not a counseling expert. I don't have a master's degree in counseling. I've taken counseling courses at a grad level. Like I've, I know some things, and espe especially when it comes to this ACBC stuff. I know that philosophy of counseling, uh, but I don't want to, you know, get on here and act like I'm a counseling professional. Um, I have a subscriber, uh, Don Zimmerman. She's a, a counseling uh, professional. So I'll wait until she hops in and she can speak a little bit more authoritatively on those things. All right. So let's go back over here. So that's where ACBC comes from. Comes from this guy, uh, Jay Adams. And actually what I want to do is uh, show you, you know, we're talking about uh, some of the problems now with ACBC. Um, like I said, I think that there's actually a lot of good. Biblical counseling can do a lot of good because you're using the Bible. And so most of the time, you're going to be able to see clearly, you know, when it, especially when it comes to like visible sins, that you know that these things that we're dealing with are actual sins then you can deal with it through a biblical lens, and that's great. And you can deal with those things. There are other aspects of who the counselor is. Maybe their theological position on a few things, complementarianism. Um, if they're hardcore, ultra-complementarian, there's going to be problems with their counseling. That's just the way I view it. Um, but um, sometimes, you know, it's great. Sometimes, not so great. And this is part of when it comes to not so great. So uh, this is actually from a book that Jay Adams wrote, um, the counseling um, uh, casebook uh, and uh, Christian counselors casebook. So here, I'm not going to read everything because I could probably get in trouble from YouTube for saying some of the words that are here. But uh, he gives a couple, like he, he gives some examples of things that uh, presumably he's had to deal with, or maybe he's making hypotheticals. Uh, I'm assuming that he's talking about real counseling scenarios. Well, he starts talking about um, a dad who abuses his daughter. And you can see right there what we mean by that. And um, he starts asking about some of the things that need to be investigated. So again, when I'm talking about like that data, uh, inquiry, you know, they, they want to get as much data as possible. They're always asking questions. <coughs> well, sometimes questions don't need to be asked. Um, and sometimes questions hurt. Uh, and I think that a lot of biblical counselors and ACBC guys, uh, they just don't get that. Uh, they don't get that those questions aren't going to be taken as, oh, I just need to ask this. Uh, they're going to seem very accusatory, especially these kind. Um, so look right here. What was behind Shirley's refusal to have sexual? Now, so we're talking about a husband, wife, child, and the child was abused, as you could see right there. What was behind Shirley's refusal to have sexual relations with Brad, the husband, that presented the temptation to sin? You must instruct her that her refusal was also a sin on her part, that, as God says, may lead to such consequences. Do you see, like, what's wrong with that? I'm sure a lot of the women who are watching this can certainly see what's wrong with that. But where is Jay Adams putting the blame? Where is this biblical counselor, uh, this newthetic counselor, putting the blame when he's, you know, saying, oh, we need to investigate this. You need to figure out things, you know, what's going on here. He's putting the blame on a husband, a father abusing his daughter 
on the wife and not performing in the bed. Like that's, those kinds of things happen. This isn't a book. Okay. <laughs> like this isn't, this isn't something that he just said off the cuff and like, he just messed up real bad. This is something that he thought I need to publish this. And this, like, I, I wish that I could have found my Jay Adams books. I have them over in storage just over there, but it's behind a bunch of other stuff. And I still dealing with like the COVID stuff. <laughs> like I I'd moved a bunch and I was trying to get at it and couldn't find them. And I gave up after going through like the eighth bin and moving things around because I got tired, uh, COVID. <laughs> but, um, this, this is the kind of stuff that's going to be said. Now, this isn't where he ends it either. <coughs> if possible. So blame he puts on, um, on the mom, uh, on the wife. And then if possible, did the daughter participate willingly in the sin? And did she entice her father? You want to know that in order to deal properly with the daughter and the mother, and in order to safeguard these relationships for the future in so doing, you probably will want to make it clear that you are not interested in exonerating Brad by what you find. Regardless of what the daughter did, there is no excuse for his sinful action. Like, this is when you're talking out of both sides of your mouth. Um, when you're saying, like, of course, you didn't do this. But did you do this? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Now, I understand what he's doing there. Uh, and I understand some of that desire. When you are trained in this kind of a system, and you are trained to ask these kinds of questions, where everything is a sin problem, a personal sin problem, that you did something in this scenario... These are the kind of thoughts that you will inevitably have. You will question the victim. You will always question them. Uh, you will look at them and say, like, there's got to be something more to this. People don't just act that way. Well, I can tell you, and I uh, do need to be careful <laughs> once again uh, of scenarios. They will do this. And it doesn't matter what anyone did, what the wife did, what children do. There are monsters in this world. We are totally depraved. And some people will act out that depravity in horrific ways. And it is no one else's fault. Uh, you don't need to ask those kind of questions. You don't need to put blame onto people where there is no blame. Now, this is also, uh, you know, regardless of what you think about Bathsheba and David, this is part of the problem that I see in that conversation too. Like I have a video here on my channel. Did David rape Bathsheba? And I can think, you know, of people from this scenario where they're thinking these kinds of questions, of course, they're going to say no. Well, when you read that text and you read what Nathan says about the innocent lamb, it becomes very clear, at least from my point of view. If you disagree, that's fine. But I'm, I'm going to ask you if you disagree you need to think through, are you trying to ask similar questions to this one? You know, to what Jay Adams is kind of getting at. You would never ask those things. We're not accusing you of that. But you need to think through those kinds of thought processes. Because a lot of people, they just assume that. Now, uh, that's, that's Jay Adams, though, right? So we need to talk about ACBC and what do they actually teach and do. Uh, well... If you look on their website, they have a membership covenant. And once again, the reason why we're bringing this up is because John Street, uh, who has been in some of those videos that have gone around, he is the president of the board of trustees. So he's not like just some random guy. He's not some random counselor. He knows what he's talking about. He has things certainly going like, like he has these kinds of situations that he's dealt with. So he's not just, you know, talking for the sake of talking. This is, these are his beliefs. He's not just bringing up random examples. Okay. A lot of people were like, Oh, he was just trying to like represent what was said in a book or, uh, he, he was just, you know, came up with a bad analogy. I've heard that like, no, these, these are real thoughts and they stem from teaching like, uh, ACBC again, not everyone, but look at the membership covenant. Um, I am in agreement with the Constitution, bylaws, standards of conduct, policies, and procedures, and the doctrinal statement of the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors, blah, blah, blah. Biblical counselors affirm the value and usefulness of the entirety 
of God's revelation, including, and this is how they specify these things. Uh, you know, we talked a couple times about common grace. Well, this is why, like we're, we'll, we'll look at this here in a minute. Um, they want to talk about it as including general and specific revelation. General revelation is a display of the goodness and power of God in the things he has made. The divine self-disclosure and general revelation leads to the condemnation rather than salvation. Special revelation is recorded exclusively and completely in the scriptures. It is inspired, inerrant, authoritative, and sufficient rule for all of life and faith because counseling concerns matters of life and faith before God, Scripture is an inspired, inerrant, authoritative, and sufficient rule for the presuppositions, principles, and practices. They had to do the alliteration. Uh, practices of counseling. We deny, this is important, we deny that the findings of secular psychology make any essential contribution to biblical counseling. God's goodness allows that secular psychology may provide accurate research and make observations that are helpful in understanding counseling issues because unbelievers suppress the truth of God in unrighteousness. The efforts of secular psychology at interpreting these observations leads to misunderstanding because their observations are distorted by a secular apprehension of life. Their efforts at counseling ministry will be in competition with biblical counseling. They cannot be integrated with the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So a lot here, but essentially what's being said here is that, you know, when you are part of ACBC, you sign this covenant, you are saying that you believe that the Bible is the rule, like, and all Christians would say like, yeah, of course, <laughs> you know, like that it is sufficient for all life and godliness, right? Like we, we, we get that. We, we understand that. Um, but what they're saying is that it is intended to be used in this manner for counseling. And that's where I would then start to disagree. Um, and where I think a lot of Christian counselors who would not claim this title of being newthetic, um, that they, they would disagree. And it's when you start using the Bible for purposes that it was not intended for. Um, this happens when it comes to using the Bible as a science book. Does it contain truths about science? Of course. Is it true in every aspect that it claims about science? Yes, that's what I believe. Um, you know, I, I believe that the, that the Bible is infallible, that it is inerrant, that it is completely trustworthy, that it is completely accurate. I hold to the 1689, if everyone's wondering, when it comes to these issues. So you can believe that, but does it talk about every aspect of science? No, of course not. But what they're saying is because that there's uh, aspects of counseling that would involve what they call life and faith, well, then the Bible is the textbook, uh, like it is the textbook to use, that you are to use it for counseling. But that is, again, once, once again, negating that there is any physical aspect. Because you would look at the Bible, and of course, you would never say that it should be used as a textbook for medicinal purposes. You know, there's there's some people who like to smoke certain things and they want to say that, well, every herb <laughs> was given to us, right? So we can use it. Of course, that's ridiculous. But that's, that's where that kind of uh, thinking leads to. They want to be able to say that the Bible is a textbook to use for medicine. Now, are there medicinal things in there? Sure. I mean, even Paul. Take a little wine for your tummy, Timothy. You know, like you, you'll feel a little bit better. There are certain things in there that are clear. <coughs> but it doesn't say everything about medicine. And when we start talking about the human person, uh, again, ACBC, they would say that you are made of spirit and body. You got them both. You need to be able to have both of those different needs, different conflicts that arise because of those two different aspects of who we are. Uh, you would need to have that remedied. Um, but here, they're not saying that. They're saying something completely different. They're saying that, well, all of your problems are spiritual, and the Bible talks about spiritual things, so the Bible is what we should only use. And that's why they say, we deny that the findings of secular psychology make any. They don't say 
they don't say that it's not as helpful as we think like that a lot of people think they don't say that they say that we deny that the findings of secular psychology make any essential contribution to biblical counseling in other words throw it completely out now a lot of times they will say other things to try to kind of rein that in a little bit and be like well of course there are good things like even here uh, they, they talk a little bit about uh, different aspects uh, of secular counseling that, that might be helpful. They say may provide accurate research and make observations. But that doesn't negate what they just said in the, the paragraph before. Like, it's still there. That paragraph's still standing there, and it says that they don't make any essential contribution to biblical counseling. Now, um, now, if you're wondering, okay, that's ACBC, but we, you know, you have John MacArthur in uh, um, the thumbnail. Why do you have John MacArthur in the thumbnail? You're just trying to get clicks, all those kinds of normal things that I get uh, told about. <coughs> Here's what John MacArthur in his book, Counseling, How to Counsel Biblically, which actually has some stuff from John Street that I would also like to read. Um, but this is what John MacArthur talks about. And I've, I've shared this before on a live stream, so if you heard this before, you know, you're welcome. I don't know. There may be no more serious threat to the life of the church today than the stampede to embrace the doctrines of secular psychology. There are a mass of human ideas that Satan has placed in the church as if they were powerful, life-changing truths from God. Most psychologists... Most psychologists epitomize neo-Gnosticism, claiming to have secret knowledge for solving people's real problems. Though many psychologists call their techniques, quote, Christian counseling, most of them are merely secular theory to treat spiritual problems with biblical references tacked on. So that is what John MacArthur thinks about psychology. It is a mass of human ideas that Satan has placed in the church. Uh, that and so that's all counseling outside of biblical counseling. That's their view. So what they're arguing for is that you can't integrate any of that. Like you can't bring any of that stuff in. You got to keep it all outside because you know Satan is involved. You don't want Satan coming into the church. So keep it all out there. Now what we talked about a few times is this idea of common grace. Now if you look back over here. They're trying to say that, uh, you know, it's about revelation. And that's, of course, what they want to do because they want to always go back to the Word of God. And again, I love the Word of God. It is extremely valuable in all of these uh, scenarios. But there's a difference between saying the Bible should be the first thing that we go to and that the Bible should be the only thing that we go to. And that's what they would argue, that the Bible is the only thing that we go to. And so they put it into a category of revelation and they say, well, we have specific revelation and specific revelation gives us freedom because it talks about the gospel and it reveals who God is. That's good stuff. We need to focus on the specific revelation and general revelation that just gives us all the bad stuff, the condemnation. Well, they're forgetting what Roman uh, Romans one says, even though they have it tacked on there. <coughs> There are good things about general revelation. It doesn't just give us condemnation. Uh, yes, it gives us condemnation because it shows us that we know that there is a God, but that is a good thing that we know that there is a God, right? Like that leads people to repentance sometimes. Like it leads them from general revelation to uh, special revelation. But besides that, that's not even like the point of what's being talked about. We're not talking about revelation. We're talking about whether there is goodness and good ideas that are outside the Bible. And let's put it into a category of Christianity. Are there good things that non-Christians can do? In, are there any helpful things that they can learn and teach to people that are outside the Bible? And what they're saying is no. Not when it comes to this issue of the, the human condition when it comes to issues of sin and um, habits and, um, you know, our, our personalities, all of that. They would say no. Well, we understand that we were made in the image of God. This is a conversation that people love to have when it comes to issues uh, uh, like political issues. I'll just put it that way. So, I, you know, 
YouTube doesn't like when you say certain words. At least that's what I've been told. Um, but when it comes to political issues, we want to talk all day about how we're created in the image of God. But then when it comes to these other things, we don't want to talk about that. Well, part of being made in the image of God is that there are effects of the image of God. Are we totally depraved? I believe so. I'm a Calvinist. I believe that. But what that means isn't that we're the worst that we could possibly be. What it means is that every aspect of who we are has been affected by sin. We are totally, wholly depraved. But there are still things that God has given us, tools that God has given us, rationality, logic being some of them, emotions being part of it, that God has given us that reflect the fact that we have been born, that we were made in the image of God. And God has given us certain good things. This is common grace. The image of God is part of common grace, that you have certain things within you that are from God. And you don't have to be a Christian in order to have those things. Now, where people get into trouble is saying like, oh, that we're, you know, that the, all those the like little aspects of common grace are so good that we don't need, you know, any of the other aspects of special revelation. But no one's arguing that. All we're saying is that people who are outside of the Christian world, who don't know Jesus, that they have been given certain things like us before we have Christ. They have been given common grace. There are certain tools, certain rationalities, certain achievements that they are capable of that are helpful for all humanity. Um, now, of course, we would be able to see this with inventions, you know, throughout history. It's not just Christians who've invented all the best things. Like, it's just people. And so when we talk about the issues that we have, the human condition, and if we understand that, yes, we are depraved, we are sinful, uh, if you just want to use the, the wording of original sin, that we have original sin, that's fine too, uh, still applies. <coughs> if you understand that, you can understand that there are certain things that we have uh, that are flawed, but there are certain things that we are capable of and we can achieve without saving faith in Christ that are still worthwhile. Are they going to give you any kind of salvific, um, you know, benefit? No, of course not. Uh, but there are good things that people can do even if they're not saved. And when you understand that we are sinners, that our bodies are corrupted, that we, we get diseases, you know, my body is still fighting off a disease that has been going around the world. <coughs> um, like you can understand that every aspect of who we are has been affected by sin. So our bodies can be affected by sin. And we can understand that as, you know, our lungs can get sick. Um, we can get diseases. Our eyes can stop working. You know, our whole body can be affected by disease, decay, all that kind of stuff, then why not our minds? Why not our minds? It makes perfect sense for our minds to be, you know, of our hearts are, you know, something that can be affected by disease. Then our minds can be affected by disease too. This isn't rocket science. Your, your mind is capable of having flaws chemical imbalances. Your mind is capable of having different aspects of, uh, uh, not necessarily flaws, but just, uh, of the way it processes things. Now, are, is everything related in that, that, uh, those words I just said, like, is that sin? No, it's not. We're not, not everything that we do is sinful, but the flaw, the biblical counseling, nuthetic counseling, the stuff that we're talking about here, that it could lead to is viewing things through that lens of everything being spiritual, nothing being physical. And if there is any physical ailment, we're talking about rare things. That's something that they always say. Uh, they will, they will say like, oh, you know, sometimes this does happen, but it's very rare. Most likely it's going to be this other thing. And we'll talk about that here in a sec. <coughs> but our minds can be affected. <clears throat> our thought processes can be affected by disease. Our, the, the chemicals in our brains can be affected. And these things are real. 
And does the Bible answer those things? Is it sufficient for those things? No. The Bible is sufficient for everything that God has intended it for. Did God intend it to fix brain chemistry? No. Now, there's certainly a lot of other things that we can apply and we can understand about the human condition and other aspects of who we are, but it's not going to fix your brain chemistry. It's just not. Now, this is something, again, I, I talked already about, like my son being on the autism spectrum. This is something that has been something that has been said to us. Well, he just needs Jesus. Like I, I've made a couple videos about it. Yes, my son needs Jesus, but to the same effect, to the same measure that I need Jesus. We all need Jesus, but that's not going to fix, uh, nor should it fix what's, what, whatever is going on in his mind about how he is wired a little bit differently. God did that. God wired him differently and he did it for a purpose. Um, so this, this is the kind of thinking that needs to be remedied when it comes to this issue of ACBC kind of stuff. Now, again, uh, they, they have a lot of different teachings. Uh, you can see even here on their uh, statement, they have a couple statements about mental illness and medicine. Uh, we are getting pretty long here, but uh, there's just a few more things I want to cover. I do want to show a video of John MacArthur here in a minute because <coughs> I think it's important on these things. Uh, but right over here, uh, they talk about how Christians today live in a secular and therapeutic culture which lacks the sophistication of the scriptures in understanding these matters. This culture attributes physical causation to many problems, ignoring their spiritual roots and implications. See, that's what I mean. What I mean when they, they'll talk about, you know, from both sides of their mouth on these things when it comes to physical stuff. They'll say one minute, oh yeah, you could take medicine for different things. But then at the same time say like, oh, you probably shouldn't because it's a spiritual problem. Well, you don't know that. Uh, are there instances of that? Yes, but I could say from personal experience as someone who's done pastoral counseling and done some hard counseling, I will say. this I, It's not just like, uh, not that, you know, different issues are less important or something like that. I'm talking about some hardcore stuff. And I will tell you, not everything is like just a spiritual issue. Sometimes there are real physical things that are going on and it happens a lot, actually. <coughs> but you can see from that. Now, I do want to show uh, a little video here in just a sec, but let's let's check in with you guys, see what you guys are talking about. Mm. KL says, this guy sounds like a potato. Okay, let's uh, let's do that. Thanks, appreciate that. Um, Genuine JC, nice. Knowing the day creed is essential for a defense of the resurrection today. I think he was referring to Luke in the sermon. Uh, Sarah, or that wife needed to call her husband a moron and Abigail her way out of there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, I think a big issue... Uh, is there doesn't seem to be agreement between psychology, medicine, and ACBC on what exactly is considered abuse. Yes. And once again, a lot of these guys don't have um, the training necessary. I don't mean to belittle people in their education. But like I, like I said a little bit ago, I'm not an expert on counseling. Um, I've had to do it as a pastor, and I've taken grad-level classes, so it's not like I didn't, you know try to substitute anything. I took counseling courses, but you don't take a lot when you get an MDiv. Uh, you don't take a whole bunch of counseling uh, for, um, you know, just becoming a pastor. Um, now, some people do because they see it as like a worthwhile thing and they want to maybe do a lot of training and uh, maybe even set up like an outside the church kind of office and help people. Some people do, but a lot of people who, you know, have doctorates, don't have doctorates in counseling. Uh, they don't have doctorates in any form of counseling or psychology, whatever system you want to use. They just don't. And so a lot of us have to fail and learn. And uh, when you fail, it hurts others. So um, it doesn't sound that far off from the property uh, prosperity gospel. If you are righteous enough and believe enough, all your problems will go away. Marriage, depression, cancer... 
Yes, I totally agree, Sarah. There's there's this thing, you know, a lot of people when they talk about ACBC and biblical counseling, they think of fundamentalists. And when you think of fundamentalists, you think of Baptists, like most of the time. Uh, but fundamentalism isn't just like the thing from R.A. Torrey and all those guys who wrote the fundamentals. It's not just that. It's not just like the, the Baptists who still play the pipe organ. No one should be playing the pipe organ. Even at Easter, the thing is the worst. It's an earthquake machine, and it'll just ruin your ears. That's that's my philosophy. It might be the, the you know most controversial thing I say today. Um, but you, it's not just those. It's also charismatics fundamentalism doesn't just have one denomination. It is an attitude. Uh, and that attitude can affect different denominations. Um, and so uh, like I've known a lot of people, uh, within, um, you know, I've, I've known a lot of great charismatics by the way, but, uh, I've known some charismatics that are fundamentalists and would hold to those kinds of things and say, well, you know, if you do all the right things, then you'll be good. And that's essentially what this is. If you read your Bible and you pray every day, then all your problems are going to go away, or at least they will in time. And that's not always the case because we're not solving the whole problem. Uh, John Hayes, there's a saying we use that you can't discipline a demon and you can't cast out the flesh. It's about wisdom of realizing what you are dealing with. I agree. Yeah, you have to be wise. Uh, in knowing like what is going on. So asking questions is good. Listening is even better. Listening to people present their whole problem uh, rather than butting in every five seconds. And then next thing you know, you've already come up with a remedy and you don't even know what the problem is. Yeah. <coughs> Genuine JC, next to no counseling in my MDiv was very surprised, right? That's a lot of us. Like, uh, I had to substitute a few things in order to get some counseling courses. And, uh, I took counseling from like, again, <laughs> people who wrote this book, <laughs> like, I'm not going to say who it is. Uh, but I've, I've taken courses from people who are in this book, uh, and a lot of good things they said, but also, you know, some, some things that weren't so good. And so like, it's about being able to discern really what, what is uh, important in these conversations. <clears throat> Let's go over here. And I do want to show because, um, you know, this, the whole thing that got me going on this thing, this is something that I've thought of for a while. Um, because of coming out of fundamentalism, you got to question basically everything as you come out, um, about like specific avenues of teaching that like, was this actually good or not? I don't know. Um, not deconstruction, but mostly just about like, the camps that you belong in and those, those things like, um, basically the culture wars where you fit in, in the culture wars. And I will say, uh, before it was music, it was psychology. Look at the seventies and the eighties. <clears throat> Jay Adams wasn't, wouldn't have been the only guy who would have written something about it. Uh, but let's listen to, uh, John MacArthur and, uh, him talk a little bit about what he thinks when it comes to, psychology. I want you to hear it directly from him. Is that coming through? That's muted. That's there is, by definition, psychology, the study of the soul, is uh, a secular, godless, unbiblical approach to analyzing humanity, designing solutions to their problems. Okay. It's godless right off the bat. Why? Well, because it comes from the world and they have that view about common grace. But the truth is man in his fallen condition cannot really make a completely clear and accurate assessment of the human condition. Certainly he can't offer true solutions to what goes on in life. Unless you understand people the way the Bible lays them out as fallen, dead in sin, blind, cut off from the life of God, deceived, and desperately wicked. Okay, so basically what he's saying is, like, like what I said, 
is unless you view it as you are totally depraved, then you can't help people. That's essentially what he just said. Uh, that psychologists, they can't help because they have a wrong anthropology. Um, essentially, if you don't come from a Christian perspective, when it comes to anything regarding people, there's nothing good that you can be uh, like that can be said from you. That's essentially what he's arguing for. You can't get to the solution. But human psychology doesn't see man that way. Human psychology, because it's simply a reflection of the pride of man's fallen heart, overestimates man's capability, man's value, man's goodness, consequently never really gets to the problem. And oh, by the way, as far as psychiatry goes, uh, for many years since Freud kind of invented that, uh, all kinds of counseling therapy techniques were tried, and they just kept falling by the wayside and falling by the wayside until finally, uh, psychiatrists today basically give people pills. They medicate them, go. which doesn't solve anything, but dulls the feelings of anxiety. That's not Did you hear that? Uh, basically, what he's saying is that what psychology has led to is pills, giving people pills, and it doesn't solve anything. That's what Johnny Mac teaches. His own words, not taken out of context. We're watching this little video of his views on education and psychology. And of course, you know, you see the master's college right there. Like this is not something that's like on the outside of this whole conversation when it comes to what Julie Royce wrote um, specifically when it comes to the issue of Eileen Gray and uh, John Street and his teaching. This is why. Not a solution to anything. A right diagnosis of man leads to a right remedy, and both are revealed in Scripture. So we teach people a true understanding of man, his condition, and a true path of genuine solutions that, that change lives. They come from the Word of God. All right. So that's, that's what he teaches. That's what masters teaches. That's the way they view psychology. It's the way they view medication, uh, that these things don't actually help anyone. Now, again, like I said, uh, if you understand what Johnny Mac says, that we're totally depraved, that we're sinful creatures, that we're all fallen, well, then it stands to reason that if you can get sick, your body can get sick, your mind can get sick, there could be chemical imbalances, things can go wrong in your mind that Scripture will not be able to solve because it was not intended from God to be a medical textbook that's using Scripture in a way that God did not intend, which they would, of course, argue is a very horrific thing to do. But they, they won't look in the mirror and say, maybe, maybe we made a mistake here. No, because they understand. And psychologists, they don't. And they just want to get people out their door. They want to make money. That's, that's essentially where it leads to. So there's a lot more that could probably be said, but I've run a little long here. There's stuff about licensure, um, you know, whether people with actual credentials who come into ACBC can get qualified. They can't unless they make a special appeal. That's concerning. Um, and they would, of course, take the programming and everything, but they still have to make a special appeal. Uh, there's lots more that could be said about it. Uh, but let me know. You know, we got a couple couple minutes here. I, I do want to know if you have any thoughts about what Johnny Mac said uh, or anything that I've said. Let me let me know. Um, Sarah, again, what about scripture that talks about governing authorities being put in place by God to protect the vulnerable? Well, isn't it interesting that that's been something that's been fought against the last couple of years? It's just interesting how these things happen. Um, why is John MacArthur talking about medication? He's not a scientist or medical doctor, but he's a pastor. And after all, pastors have the infallible word of God. So they get to talk about everything authoritatively. That's, that's where it leads to. That's the kind of thought processes that come into this issue of biblical counseling. So again, not every biblical counselor, not everyone who would call themselves a neuthetic counselor is going to be John MacArthur. Let me put it this way. Both of these books, 
come from the world of ACBC, come from the world of Nuthetic Counseling, have been impacted by Jay Adams considerably. But not both of these books are the same. There are good guys in here who have written very good things. And I would say for the most part, this book has been extremely helpful. This one, on the other hand, is very accusatory. It lo- this, this book basically is like, here's what the Bible can do for you. And this one is like, this is why the world can't answer anything. <laughs> like, it's a very different set of philosophies. And what I would say is the difference between these two is one is fundamentalist and one is not, or at least not as much. And that's what I would say is the problem with these kinds of philosophies. When it comes to fundamentalism, they'll take it, they'll run with it, they'll get legalistic about it, and then they'll hurt people. Fundamentalism always hurts people. Now, not everyone who claims to be a fundamentalist is that kind of fundamentalist. That's not what I'm saying. But when you get into that attitude and it becomes bloated and prideful, as I think you can clearly see from that clip and many other clips and different things that are going on online. Um, there, there, there is a sect of fundamentalism that is hurting people through their use of biblical counseling. So we need to be very careful. Is biblical counseling good? It can be. When used properly it, with a skilled pastor who is empathetic and kind, It can be, but it can also be abused into being a rod that people just whack over the head of victims and people who are hurting, who don't need that. They need comfort and love. And sometimes they need a medical professional to step in and be like, Hey, there's something else that's going on here that a pastor can't see. And so when are we going to be able to use these different schools of thought? Well, that's where wisdom comes in. And unfortunately, not everyone has a a good sense of what it takes between these two different philosophies of the soul, how to deal with the soul and how to deal with the body. And that is super unfortunate. It leads to a lot of hurt and pain within the local church. And then it comes out in these uh, controversies and scandals. You know, if we dealt with things biblically, And then also, you know, realize that there are places the Bible was never intended from God to be authoritative in and uh, for scripture to be used in a certain way, like when it comes to like medical things. Um, Well, that's that's when you can get into a lot of trouble. Uh, But if you agree with me, always do it. Always hit the like button. Uh, Think about subscribing if you're new to the channel. Hit the notification bell. Uh, subscribe to the newsletter. There's a link in the description of this video, but definitely most important to hit that like button. Um, because like I've always said, when it comes to these things, and I've just noticed just recently, like, it's just like the last, like two months, basically, there are always going to be people who come on my channel and, uh, think I think I sound like a potato or whatever that guy said. (laughs) And, uh, they just, they just want to hate. So, uh, if you agree, hit that like button, it, it will definitely help me out. Um, but anyways, uh, I will be back probably on Thursday, uh, for another video. Not sure what that video is going to be about. Uh, but I appreciate your time. If you have questions, leave them down in the comments and I'll interact with you there and I will see you in the next video. I hope you have a great day.